Welcome to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran, and I'm uh, joined this week uh, by a more than a 20-year veteran of the uh, U.S. Air Force. Uh, he's uh, no longer wearing a, a, an Air Force uniform to work. He's uh, now wearing a, a UTSA uniform to work. And uh, so we're going to be talking about the National Security Collaboration Center, uh, which is a, a joint project um, kind of championed and run out of UTSA, but uh, retired Brigadier General Guy Walsh, who's the founding executive director of that National Security Collaboration Center, will uh, help explain uh, all the background and details uh, on how it came about and uh, where it's headed from here. If uh, you are listening to this uh, on iHeartRadio streaming or in your car on 1200 WAI, we'll uh, be talking about this for the next hour. If you are not going to be able to stick with us but want to hear this story, check out our website at www.cybertalkradio.com uh, or any of your uh, favorite podcasting services is out there. Uh, this program will go up on our website and out all across the internet, uh, including uh, on our YouTube channel with a still photo of uh, Guy and I uh, as we have this conversation. That will be up on Tuesday, November the 5th. Uh, so it'll be a, a couple of days after we've been live. If you are listening via one of those podcasting or streaming services uh, there and enjoying this program, uh, let us know on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, you can uh, find us on both of those at CyberTalk Radio. Uh, what we're doing good, uh, what you would like to see us do differently. And uh, if you've got questions for uh, the program or any of our guests, you can ask us there. And, and we know where these guests are, at least most of the time, and we can track them down and get you some answers. So Guy, thank you very much for joining us today. Howdy, Brett. Thank yeah. you very much for the invitation. Yeah. So uh, you uh, it spent a bunch of time in the Air Force um, prior to coming here for this in San Antonio. But during your Air Force duty, were you ever stationed in San Antonio yourself? I was not. No. I had the uh, pleasure of coming here on numerous uh, temporary duties uh, and travel uh, most recently with both 24th, 25th Air Force, which, as you know, just recently converted to the to the brand new 16th, 16th Air, Air Force. Force. And so, yeah, so uh, having the opportunity to come here to visit uh, several times, uh, both myself and then our, our son went through pilot training over in Del Rio and spent some time flying at Randolph here as well. So those those were my uh, ties that, that brought me and gave me the opportunity to say, here's where we want to end up landing after we finish our uh, uh, tour back at Fort Meade. Yeah, and I played in a, a charity golf tournament out there at Randolph, and there's one of the holes on the golf course. You're there in a cart, and the, the planes are landing. You're crossing an active runway to go between one of the holes and the others. As a civilian, that was a that was entertaining for me for one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there were folks there telling us when we were allowed to cross that one. But have you been out there for that at Randolph or seen that before? I, I maybe, have. I've, yeah. I've been at several of those bases there. Yeah, it's a, it can be a little bit distracting, right, as you're trying to tee off or uh, hit that nice uh, – 15 foot putt and all of a sudden uh the the sound of uh jet noise comes over your head yeah yeah i'm, I'm pretty noisy me but yeah folks ask so like well why do these air force bases have golf courses like well, they gotta have grass around the runway so they just put golf holes on it in a lot of cases yeah uh so on our, our subject for today national security collaboration center so this is not something that's run by the military this is not a military operation but they are, are partners in it um at, at some level so Help uh, our listeners understand what is this National Security Collaboration Center at a high level. Absolutely. So, so the vision really came about probably a couple of years ago, uh, and it was uh, our president at UTSA, uh, President Taylor Amy, uh, who had uh, when he when he took over as the president here, he came from a research university type background, and uh, he sat down with Admiral McRaven at that time uh, that uh, had had been with the University of Texas Systems. And had this concept of saying we want to develop this national security collaboration center, giving, given uh, everything that the city and community of San Antonio brings to that. And so that's what it is. It's really building upon an ecosystem that already exists in San Antonio, both with the federal government presence here. And we'll sure we'll talk a little bit about that with the industry, both startups and the, the growth of of the city of San Antonio. Uh, as well as some of the academic partners we have, both right here in San Antonio as well as throughout Texas. So it was all about uh, being able to, one, is advance research, right? UTSA is clearly uh, one of the leading research universities in the U.S. It's, uh, it was listed as, uh, rated as the top uh, research and university in cybersecurity, specifically in 2017 by Ponyman. And uh, it was about building upon that research foundation that exists at UTSA, building the workforce development that we know we need in the cybersecurity areas to meet all of the requirements of, of our industry and federal partners here in the San Antonio and throughout the Texas area. 
Uh, so that workforce development piece there. And then really advancing education and changing uh, the dynamics. Uh, and I'll, I will say from a national perspective in terms of getting people focused and understanding that, hey, it's not just for programmers and coders, but the, the idea in terms of working in the cybersecurity area, it impacts us all and we can all play a role in that. Yeah, uh, and we've we've had um, a, a number of uh, the folks uh, from the faculty at UTSA on the the program talking about um, some of those things you just brought up. Whether it's it's in the actual school of computer science uh, and and where you're in that sort of super technical coding, or some of the the programs in the school of business where you're looking at cyber risk and risk management and process control and all the rest of that. So uh, for listeners out there, if you wanted to learn kind of more about the the breadth of cybersecurity and all the things that it covers, um, check out our website, um, look up for episodes with uh, Dr. Nicole Beebe or Dr. Greg White. Um, I believe we've also had Dr. Uh, Dietrich on the program as well, um, I I think, and and kind of covering all of the different aspects of many of the cybersecurity programs at UTSA specifically but the great thing about UTSA is it's broad enough um, in their coverage of cyber that they hit all of the the main areas. So it's it's not all just Mr. Robot on TV and the, the hacker in front of the computer trying to, to break into systems. There's a ton more to cybersecurity than that. Because if you're only securing things at, at the, the software level, um, as you start to get in and do those business spreadsheets, you'll find that that's a really expensive way to, to put controls around things. So, uh, Guy, so as, as you, you, uh, you've come here now to uh, open this up, and uh, one of the, the areas we like to share with a lot of our listeners, we have many uh, the students in middle school and high school that listen to the program or their parents uh, that are participating in Cyber Patriot now. So they, how do they get themselves from kind of yeah, where they are now doing Cyber Patriot as a kid through to, to a spot in your career? So um, we'll do a little, I guess, walk. You just said you had your, your 40th college reunion here this year. So um, well, for these, these uh, kids, we'll, we'll go back and kind of walk through some of that. So you um, enlisted and you were able to get into the Air Force Academy for, for college. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think from the perspective of this starts, this literally starts at the K through 12, right? And that's, that's the area that uh, you were just hitting on there yeah. is how do you get folks interested in this piece there? Uh, and you just mentioned Dr. Greg White. So uh, two weeks ago, we were uh, down in Port San Antonio. We were doing the Cyber Threat Defender Challenge. Yeah. Uh, one of the ones that uh, here has been big local in San Antonio. And you also mentioned the uh, um, Cyber Patriot Program, the Air Force Association Project. Literally, this starts at those schools, and, and we have tremendous here within within San Antonio, within the school district, probably one of the largest participation in uh, that I, I think cyber patient. Hopefully, program. we're going to be number one still this year. We were number one last year, more than even Los Angeles, which is, I think, three times our size from a region and number of people. But we had more teams than they did last year. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, the, and the folks out of the Cyber Texas Foundation, the Chris Cooks, they do an amazing the job. Bernie Scotch of, of working with the with the students. And as you know, most of these, it, it's not actually a, a physical class. These are like clubs and groups that get together and do this. And it's not any particular area of Texas. It's throughout, all around the Beltway from the 1604, from the, from the southeast up to the northwest uh, across that. And so it's neat to watch how that how that occurs. And it's really being built, like I said, from the ground up of building that interest in STEM, uh, both inside the classrooms that that are being built, as well as outside the classroom with programs such as the Cyber Threat Defender, such as the Cyber Patriot program. Yeah. So when when you went to university, clearly at that point, you were, you mentioned a little bit already, you were studying on the flight engineering and you were becoming a pilot. So, but cybersecurity didn't really exist at that point in time. I guess we're celebrating the 50th birthday here this year of ARPANET. Um, So it was a little bit alive in this uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. That's what ARPA stands for. Um, And so there was a network that was up. It it was around for, I guess, 10 years before you, you, when you finished school, had been there for a decade. But um, not really the internet as we know it today. And there wasn't uh, a whole, numbered air force that focused on computer network security or even computer security at that point in time. So I kind of, how did your, your career evolve to where now you're, you're neck deep every day in, in computer security and cybersecurity side of things. Yeah, so, so my class, I believe was the last class not to be issued a slide rule. Although I did have one, uh, we actually had uh, some of the first computers. I, I believe that those computers have uh, probably about 1% of the computing power that 
our Android or our Apple phone has right now. For sure. Uh, and we probably paid about the same price that you pay for a brand new phone right now back at that time frame. And so, yeah, I, I came slow or, or late at least to the game here in terms of I had started out uh, basically in, in more of the uh, traditional uh, sciences and engineering from civil engineering, aerospace engineering, uh, and then getting into the flying domain. And so that was where my career took me. I, actually, I will say until I uh, came into the National Guard back in around 2003, when I entered that organization, we had one of the very first National Guard, uh, what was called a network warfare squadron at that time, but information operations and cyber and cybersecurity. And they were assigned to and supporting the National Security Agency uh, down the road there. The, the fact that we did that with the National Guard was somewhat just of a anomaly. In fact, what happened was we were transitioning from one version of the C-130 airlift type aircraft uh, to another version that required half the crew members uh, on that aircraft. It was called the C-130J at the time. And we were looking as a state to figure out how do we uh, preserve the, the bodies and not just yeah, those leave jobs. Those, yeah. those jobs. And at that time, our airlift group commander was a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Mr. Chris Inglis. Uh, Chris happened to be running signals intelligence, later became the de deputy director of the National Security Agency. And Chris said, hey, this is an important role for the National Guard to be able to play and help to develop the first two states with both Maryland and Delaware becoming the first two states. So so as the wing commander at that time, I, I was ex first exposed to that. So about 16 years ago was my real first exposure to cyber, cybersecurity and, and what I'll call that uh, that that area that we're looking at for the National Security Collaboration Center. Yeah, and I mean, as, as I think through, and I have a lot of conversations with with kids about these things that um, civil engineering, the uh, flight training, be, being a pilot. There's many of the same things you learn there that parallel to cybersecurity. So as I think about cybersecurity, you have to um, receive a certain amount of information and you're going to make a time-bound decision. Same thing when you're flying. You're looking at all of your sensors, you're looking at all of your stuff, and you have to make time-bound decisions all the time. And you, don't, you can't wait around for perfect information. You can't wait around for complete information. Uh, and you've got to decide which information to prioritize because there's so many knobs and dials. You put me in a cockpit of an airplane, I'll be distracted forever, and we'll we'll never get the plane off the ground because there's just so much information to look at. Same thing in the cybersecurity domain. So, kids, as you're out there kind of going through and studying these different areas, you're learning a lot of fundamental skills. Same thing on the civil engineering side. How do you build a solid foundation that's going to be able to support the, the weight and the different unexpected things that can happen to a, a bridge or to a building or to whatever else? You start looking at the second and third order uh, types of challenges and you have to engineer away those risks. So same thing on the cybersecurity side. How do you set up systems and then start looking at the second and third order things and how do you engineer out and mitigate those risks? So studying engineering, problem solving, um, and things that force you to, to make time-based decisions um, give you, if even if you've never studied computer security, it, it allows you to transition in probably much easier than someone who doesn't start with that kind of foundation. Absolutely. So so you brought up the key things there. One is is decision making, right? And, and we do that every day. Uh, uh, we do that if we're five years old. We do that if we're 10 years old. We do that if we're 60 years old, right? So the decision making and how do you sort through uh, the information to make an informed decision? What's changed really is the complexity of how much of that information is now available and, and, and what is the important part of that information? And, be, and that, that's the part where literally the concept of cyber, cybersecurity, data analytics, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about in terms of what is the important data for being able to make timely decisions is an important part. Now, so when I was growing up and coming up through the Air Force, remember each of the, you know, the, the IT systems was completely, completely independent of the telephone system, which was completely independent of what I will call TV and radio systems. They were all, uh, compl you know, independent systems. And now through what I'll call convergence, they're all one. And you have that in the palm of your hand in that Apple or Android or, or phone there. Yeah. And to be able to take that much information, that much, that the good news is having that much information gives you an opportunity to make, to, uh, better do risk management and make informed decisions. The question is how you sort through that. And that's a big piece of the research we're doing at, at, at UTSA, as well as the National Security Collaboration Center, is looking at how do we manage data? How do we share data? How do we control data? How do we protect it and make it more resilient so that we know the data we have is 
uh, is accurate. Yeah. No, oh, because, uh, yeah, garbage in, garbage out from decision-making perspective. Yeah, so if you, you have bad information coming into your system, uh, yeah, good people will make bad decisions with bad information. So uh, with this uh, uh, kind of tying back into the, the National Security Collaboration Center, so today um, this is running on the UTSA main campus up 1604 and I-10 area, um, and then there's a new facility being built as part of the downtown campus expansion. Uh, that's correct. So the new National Security Collaboration Center uh, is being built uh, literally uh, just across the other side of the highway from our downtown campus. Uh, we will break ground uh, sometime in uh, next year in 2020. Our goal right now is to uh, be able to open that center, and it's the it's a combined National Security Collaboration Center with the School of Data Science, and we hope to open that in 22, uh, 2022. I'll be heading out on uh, Wednesday out to uh, San Diego for what is called the um, P3 Partnership uh, for Education. There's a summit out there, and this facility in San Antonio's National Security Collaboration Center is listed as the model for the future of how we do uh, private-public partnerships in building for higher education. So we're going to head out there uh, and talk about that. We've had tremendous support both from the, the state of Texas, uh, we were able to raise over $90 million for building and, and constructing this facility uh, with a lot of our partners uh, from here in San Antonio, uh, with uh, from Graham Weston as one of our uh, uh, large sponsors to many of the different uh, organizations. And uh, so we're about to, like I said, break ground next year on that facility, and I look forward to being able to, to bring that truly to an urban environment, a very uh, the building itself, very complex in terms of what we're going to accomplish within both the School of Data Science and the National Security Collaboration Center. Yeah, because you have to go all the way from something that's uh, friendly for college students and people to pop into, but at the same time, you can have um, secure research being done in the building in, in, inside the same facility. Absolutely. So if, if you look, and, and, and there's probably, we'll, we'll provide it to you for the uh, um, website, but the, the concept right now is that bottom floor is really an, an education center open to the public so that people really understand uh, what, what national security and what cybersecurity are all about, right? What data science is about. Right now, uh, it's, it's one of those things that people don't approach it the same way they did when I was growing up as a kid. You wanted to be a pilot. You wanted to be a doctor. You wanted to be a policeman because you saw that you were exposed to those people every day you knew what they did for the public you knew that what they did for the nation you knew what they did for your community we don't have that same uh, visualization to be able to do that so we're going to be working with many of the other uh, folks from from industry from our foundations from our museums and making the bottom floor very much open to the public to expose people so that uh, that th they have this desire that same thing that uh, many of us, when we were watching, just watching airplanes take off in front from an airport, you'd sit there and say, I want to do that someday. We need to do that same thing in the cybersecurity realm. And that's what the NSCC downtown is going to do when we open that up. When you get up to the other floors of that and get up to the finally, we'll get up to what's called a, uh, a SCIF type area, uh, which is uh, sensitive, uh, and I'll get the acronym wrong, but... Uh, um, a, a classified facility to be able to do classified type work for the federal government and with our industry partners. Yeah, that's one of those. It's, it's turned into an acronym that no one actually <laughs> spells the words out anymore. But yeah, it's SCIF, and we could get one of our fact checkers in the room here to figure it out for us. But neither of us, I think, have any idea. But it's just a skiff. Everyone just calls them skiffs. Um, and and that's where yeah, you can do top secret cleared research and. Yeah, people so it, can try to blast it with microwaves and all sorts of other stuff, and and it should be immune to those. So, and that type of discussion, like I said, if it, whether it's sensitive, compartmentalized information uh, that you're working on for 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 industry partners, we call it intellectual property. Yeah, right? it's it's the secret ingredients, the secret sauce. How do we protect that? Uh, you know, for for when we're doing that, and that's important. Whether you're a college student that's trying to build out and and have intellectual property or or do a patent, or whether you're an industry person that brings that to the, and, and in the government side, it's that uh, compartmentalized or classified information. Yeah. And and uh, so on this collaboration, it's uh, the partners in this. So it's a collaboration between UTSA and then other universities in this area as well? 
Correct. So uh, let me start. So the first partners that we'll talk about typically are going to be the federal partners, because whether you're industry or academia, uh, being able to, if you're going to be a national security collaboration center, what are those requirements? What are the largest, what are the complex challenges that, that our government, and when I use the term government, I'll talk state, city, local, federal government, what do they have? So th- that, that group of partnerships, and right now that ranges about 22 partners that, we're, that we work with on the government side. On the industry side, about equivalent. We have 22 to 24 partners, uh, some of them from uh, local. Our, our, our first look is to say, what are those emerging businesses, technologies, what are those uh, small and medium businesses from the IP Secure, CNF Technologies, working with folks that are out of uh, – uh, build set foundry working out of those and then also working with some of the what I'll call the larger primes uh, the Cisco's the Raytheon's those those folks there so one is trying to build that relationship and collaboration across those organizations and the last one that you bring up is other universities so there are, there are states in the United States that uh, that the national security that don't have a certificate of academic excellence with uh, the National Security Agency. Here, only within the city of San Antonio, we have five different universities that have a certificate of academic excellence. So one is partnering with some of our local uh, universities and colleges here within San Antonio. Others are are, uh, around the the U.S. I know we're partnered right now with uh, New Mexico Tech out of Socorro, New Mexico. We're partnered with Arizona State University. Uh, we're continuously in discussions with uh, folks, and right down in here, one of our partners is uh, Texas A&M San Antonio, yeah. uh, that has an emerging cybersecurity program there. So, so yeah, it's it's building partnership across all across government, industry, and academia. We've got folks listening out here from uh, another university or another government agency or a. a uh, industry uh, that's not involved with the National Security Collaboration Center, they want to get involved. Where do they they go to learn more? So right now, it, we can go to the website. Uh, we do have a website up that uh, we'll make sure we have posted for you uh, on the National Security Collaboration Center. If you Google uh, the National Security Collaboration Center, it'll pop. It should pop right up to there. Yeah. Uh, we also, uh, I'll tell you, one of the ones that's, that's upcoming uh, here. I believe it's, and I'll. I'll get the paperwork out to your uh, audience as well. But on the 21st of November, we have a uh, uh, open to the public, our collaboration day. So every Thursday, our partners, both uh, the federal, the industry, and academic partners get together just to do that exact thing, the information sharing, collaboration. Uh, and the, the one that we're holding on the 21st of February will be here at the downtown campus. I know as uh, our, our current guests that we have, we have uh, Terry Williams from UTSA uh, with uh, talking about some of the state grants that she's working right now in the cyber and cybersecurity piece there. We also have uh, Mr. Ernesto Ballesteros, uh, and he will be uh, from uh, DIR from the state uh, talking about their cybersecurity programs and where they're going. So. Uh, we'll get that information again to your listeners, but I think that that that's an example of uh, some of the things that we're doing to to get the word out. Yeah, and, and we've we've seen the importance of municipal governments uh, improving their cybersecurity and risk posture here man, through the uh, summer of 2019. Uh, there were some are 20 to 30 of our different um, city governments in the state of Texas all got ransomware at the same time because they were all running the same back office software with the same patching level. Uh, with the same exact configuration. Uh, so for listeners out there, even if you're trying to be consistent for maintainability, you could make just a few little tweaks so that the same scripted automated thing doesn't hit you and your neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor and all the rest of those without really impacting your maintainability and supportability of your your system. So but, uh, yeah, you can get involved in the National Security Collaboration Center and, and learn some more sophisticated things you could do uh, to avoid having to uh, potentially uh, pay out a big ransom. I don't know that dollar amounts got released um, for the ones here in the state of Texas on if they paid or what they did, but uh, a couple of uh, smaller cities in the state of Florida, they did release the dollar amounts, and those uh, cities paid over uh, $400,000 for one of them, and this was a, a tiny town of maybe twenty five or 30,000 people spent a big chunk of their budget to, to get all of their information out of ransom. Um, and that's just uh, would have been much less expensive for them to implement a basic uh, security uh, program up front. Um, that four hundred thousand dollars might have paid for the next twenty years of security programs for a municipality of that size. So, 
Uh, we are going to take a quick break here for news, traffic, and weather update on 1200 WAI. Uh, and then uh, Executive Director Guy Walsh of the National Security Collaboration Center and I will be back uh, after that break to continue discussing uh, where they're at now, uh, where things are headed, and uh, how we're going to uh, use this research to make uh, the world a safer place. Welcome back to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20 year internet security veteran. And I'm talking about the National Security Collaboration Center uh, today with the founding executive director, uh, retired Brigadier General Guy Walsh. Uh, and this is a, as most of you, I, was, I find it funny. It's a, you retired out of the military uniform, but no one, it doesn't seem like anyone that really retires from the military just retires after that. Most of y'all go on to second careers that are um, as interesting or maybe even more interesting than your first career. So, so that's certainly been the case here. One of those uh, that all, all we do is we transition where our time is spent as opposed to, uh, in, in that case, uh, in, in uniform and being what I would call operational, whether that be executing operations, planning operations. Uh, for, for me, it was literally the opportunity to say, okay, I've had this amazing career for 40 plus years, given amazing opportunities. How do I share that with folks? What is it that I you know, can contribute to share in terms of uh, uh, to give other folks the same opportunities that I was given throughout my career. And that's, I think that's what part drove me to the idea of getting involved at a university academic, uh, but literally working down to the K through 12 organizations as well and doing that, that you really feel that, okay, here's what I've learned over that period of time. And, and like you alluded to earlier, I may have learned it in airplane, but the concepts are still completely uh, relevant in the cyber and cybersecurity world. Uh, you talked about being, uh, unpredictable and not just following the same patterns and those type of things, yeah. but, but being deliberate in that and to be able to make informed de- decisions. And that's what flying airplanes was all about. And, and we talked about this a little bit during the break in terms of when you, when you were in air to air engagement, it was these small moves or we called them jinx that was able to uh, change the, the adversary's movement uh, to be able to fool an adversary, to be able to, uh, to be able to win in, in, in a battle of the wits here. And that's yeah. where we're at right now. It's no longer, uh, it, it's a battle of cognition to be able to outthink an enemy and, and be able to take some of those things that I learned from flying airplanes and now apply them uh, in, in working with students, working with researchers to drive that towards something that's going to change national security. So to me, it's the best of both worlds, being able to share my experiences, but being able to still have an impact on national security, in this case, from the academic perspective. And with uh, uh, with UTSA, that's a tremendous opportunity now. Yeah. So uh, when you, you got the, the phone call about this opportunity, where, where were you at? And were you still in the, the National Guard at that point in time? Or how did you find out about the National Security Collaboration Center executive director role? So I was uh, no longer in uniform. I was at U.S. Cyber Command working as an advisor to the executive director. Uh, I had become involved in the previous six months working with universities. Uh, learned very quickly that um, uh, UTSA had this amazing reputation for a, and I'll, I'll use the term relatively small school, and, and compared to the major, uh, very uh, large, like the Michigans or Purdue's or Cal Berkeley or some of those, but but the reputation was just as big. So U.S. Uh, or UTSA in this case uh, was one of uh, only 12 universities in the United States that held all three of the national securities uh, centers of uh, academic excellence. Right, uh, they held the one for research, for uh, defense or education, and then the newest one that they received in 2008, which was the certificate of academic excellence for. Uh, cyber operations, a uh, very difficult and challenging uh, one one to get out there. So, so I did learn about it through building when we were building U.S. Cyber Command, and that's the Title Ten organization that does military operations. When we were building that organization, we were structuring it and building it based on what the National Security Agency had built over decades. So they have a very mature program with over 275 universities, and we did not have that type of a program at that. So, so that's where I first learned about. UTSA, uh, and and then literally received a phone call, and I'll use the term out of the blue, but it was a uh, uh, phone call, not even an email at that time, but to say, hey, we understand that uh, um, 
uh, this would be the, the opportunity at the National Security Collaboration Center may be something you're interested in. And so I'll follow up with that with a few emails. I did uh, several interviews, uh, both online interviews as well as, uh, you know, I'll call it paper interviews. And then finally the opportunity to come here. I believe that was in the April, May time frame to come to USA, UTSA and actually meet with the folks uh, both from the university as well as from the, the community out here for, for the interview process. Yeah, and I guess uh, lucky for us it doesn't snow in San Antonio or, <laughs> or you, you'd have been coming down here without your wife. So that, that was it. I mean, that was the driving factor is to, to find that, uh, uh, that location. The, the, the UTSA, and, and this goes back to what I saw within, they were highlighted as a top university by the National Security Agency, uh, both for uh, its, its education that it has uh, in terms of cyber, cybersecurity, in terms of information system, data science, a huge one. And, and we'll talk in a little bit about the artificial intelligence piece that is the, the largest emerging type piece of that. Uh, but, but very particularly, uh, they were, uh, the NSA had highlighted the workforce development piece of that, that of what we're building for both now the new 16th Air Force, NSA Texas. Uh, the university itself had built several certificate type programs to meet the needs uh, of, uh, of the workforce right at NSA Texas and at 16th Air Force, the former 24th, 25th Air Force. Many of our instructors come from there. In fact, if you look at UT, UTSA's overall population, relatively small, 32,000 students, 15% of those have a military affiliation. Uh, and that's pretty amazing. Over yeah. 5,000 of the students there, uh, fairly significant. So that tie, and obviously San Antonio being, uh, you know, uh, both Cyber USA, but also Military USA in terms of that relationship between the military and our Joint Base San Antonio folks and between all the services has been absolutely tremendous. Yeah, and for, for those out there in the listening audience where if you want to get involved in cybersecurity for uh, national security and the defense, you um, going to uh, UTSA in a program like that, um, you can actually work on getting your security clearance while you are working through your research uh, and activities there at, this, at the school. You don't have to... Um, enlist in order to be able to serve from that national security perspective you can uh, get a clearance and work for uh, a company that services and provide services or you could potentially contract directly in as a a government contractor directly yourself um, and and obtain those clearances through that's one of the benefits of being a national security agency and department of homeland security um, certified center of excellence program um, and I think this also allows people that are doing that research um, in the National Security Collaboration Center, maybe working on a Ph.D. in cybersecurity, to be able to get in and really work at the top level of national security to to help solve the challenging and most difficult problems. Because there's a ton of them out there. And we've had all sorts of guests on the program um, where we've. We've talked about this, and uh, I mean, I think it's one where um, in the U.S. here we've stood up a cyber command. Uh, we've uh, NATO has stood up a, a cyber, and they've recognized it. It's its own theater of war. Uh, and you have folks like uh, Brad Smith, who's the chief legal officer at Microsoft, has asked for a Cyber Geneva Convention for years because, like, we we know in the other theaters of war what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. On the the cyber side of things, though. None of this stuff has been figured out right now. So, like, uh, in conventional warfare, you're not allowed to uh, directly attack civilians. Like, that's bad. That's a war crime. And, like, if, you're, if your primary target was, was hurting civilians, you can't do that. The cyber side of things, we were talking a little bit during the break, but um, in one of the areas you guys are doing research, industrial control systems. So, am I allowed as a, a cyber adversary to um, hack and take down the power grid? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. There's no rule of war against that. Maybe, maybe not. It's hard to say, but if you do that in San Antonio in August, like people are going to die from heat stroke. Like there's no electricity, no air conditioning here. You will you will harm civilians. Yeah, and I mean, it's a, it's a challenging area and like we haven't figured any of this stuff out yet. So so to your point there, I I think one of the things that's important to the listeners is to understand UTSA is a top-notch research university. There are many great universities to get an education out there, uh, but there's a handful that, that have the ability to do the level of research. In fact, uh, we're, we're right on the cusp right now of uh, achieving what is called R1 status. So the Carnegie ratings have this system to say, these are the top research institutes, uh, and I will say in the United States, but it's really on the planet in terms of doing those type of things. And so UTSA is leading that area, very particularly in the areas of data science 
in the areas over artificial intelligence in those areas. So, so the students, the folks who come to uh, uh, get, whether they're, it's a, at the bachelor's level, the master's degree, or Ph.D. levels, or even the certifications that we're doing uh, that are both online and the bachelor's programs online, a uh, tremendous opportunity to be exposed to uh, research areas that a lot of universities don't have that same opportunity. Yeah, and I mean the 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 growth projected um, on this as you guys build out the downtown campus um, and the the f- new building for the School of Data Science and National Security Collaboration Center. I think we'll go from twenty five to thirty five hundred students now studying some type of cybersecurity at the university up to ten thousand. Yeah, so we we have uh, somewhere uh, probably you're right. It's a, it's about thirty four thirty five hundred that are across the four primary disciplines there. Uh, from computer engineering, computer sciences, information systems, data, data analytics. Uh, and we are projecting right now, yes, to go uh, to, to by 2028 to have 10,000 students. That That is huge in terms of the workforce to be able to. So if we want to continue to bring some of the large prime organizations, we want to continue to build out what we're doing at Port San Antonio and the folks there uh, to, to give opportunities to a lot of our startup companies. Being able to have that type of a workforce development here internal to San Antonio, because as you know, uh, given the opportunity right now, the dollars uh, and and the jobs are all either on the East Coast or the West Coast, right? They're in Silicon Valley. They're in the D.C. area. They're working those areas. Being able to create that same uh, ecosystem here in San Antonio and in just like we talked about earlier, I've been looking for that place. Where do I want to live? Where would I prefer to live? Yeah. Uh, to give people the opportunity to get those same jobs, the same paying jobs, the same value in terms of the jobs, whether they be with government, industry, or academia, keeping some of those, keeping it here in San Antonio, this is where I'd want to be, right? And so, uh, and I think that's a lot with our students too. If we can provide and bring those uh, capabilities in here and have the workforce development so the, the students graduating here that want to stay here, that'll be absolutely tremendous for the community of San Antonio, for Port San Antonio, for our industry, whether it be our, our small growing industry and startups that we're doing with uh, BuildSec Foundry and other organizations, and that'll be huge. So, so this is one of the few locations, I will say, in the U.S. that you have that ingredients. You have that large federal uh, piece that's out there, the, the government piece that's out there. You have uh, numerous academic institutions that are here, and you also have that uh, the, the growing industry that's, uh, that San Antonio is bringing in. Yeah, and it, it takes all three to make that happen. I think, and, it, and this is one that um, the San Antonio is running this playbook now on cybersecurity. But if we go back a previous generation uh, with UTSA and UT Health, um, the same collaboration between the um, government and military on healthcare and the academia here and the private sector with Southwest Research and, and other private sector backed research organizations, we've um, seen what can happen there. And like, if you look at the Joint Base San Antonio, it's some of the, uh, if you're going to be a surgeon uh, in the U.S. military, you're going to stop here for a couple of years now as you get to learn all about trauma and all their other things. I think, I believe every um, surgeon now at this point in the, in the military will make a, a tour uh, stop here in San Antonio, Joint Base San Antonio, because it's the number one place in the medical side now as well. And we're doing a similar playbook here for cybersecurity. I um, want to go back to a thing you said about that tier one research, the R1 status. So for most folks are going, well, like, I mean, why doesn't UTSA have this already? Or why um, why aren't, why isn't the military doing this with UT Austin that is uh, an R1? So UTSA is only 50 years old as a university. And in, in university time, 50 years is like a brand new baby. Um, and they're, I'm, I mean, just, you go through and think, and I'm going to have to get one of our, we'll put in the recap, but. I don't know of very many universities that are less than 50 years old that are a, an official tier one research. And maybe UTSA may be the youngest when it gets there, but someone will fact check me and we'll put it in the recap of the program. But this is a big deal, and this is something that takes usually a long time. And you look at the other tier one universities, and they've been around for 150 years or 200 years or 300 years. Um, some of the names like you mentioned, like Purdue and Carnegie Mellon and University of California, Berkeley, and Stanford and some of these other places that do research in these areas that are a tier one research university are three or four times as old, or maybe, I mean, some of those on the East coast might've been around for five times as long. Yeah. There, there's no doubt that from that perspective, UTSA is on the fast track and in the express lane for 
for uh, building its capability as a research institute, having just uh, uh, achieved 50 years, whereas, uh, like you said, many of those are, are much older than that. I, I will tell you it's it's been a very deliberate approach to that. So so if you go back to 2017 when it was listed as the type cybersecurity uh, um, university in the U.S., We've built, continued to build upon that uh, in doing what I'll call the, the, the uh, cluster hires in terms of bringing in another, another 8 to 12 subject matter experts. In 2017, it was more in the cloud computing, open cloud, building those type capabilities. We've done that through virtual reality. Most recently, in 2019, we have really focused on bringing in the top experts in the world. It's a one-year search that UTSA goes through to find the top performers in terms of, uh, uh, in this case, artificial intelligence across government, across industry, and across academia. And through that search, we've been able to uh, bring in some of the, the top uh, folks in terms of researchers, in terms of academics, in terms of practitioners uh, out in industry and doing those type pieces there. And so that's why we're able to continue to grow both in our workforce development, our student engagements, because they understand that if they want to study under the best uh, and the folks who have proven themselves out there, that's uh, one of the biggest things that UTSA brings to bear now. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, as you bring those folks in and then they are able to uh, obtain grants, then not only do you get to work with uh, the, the best folks, but you get to work on the cutting edge and interesting research projects that they have that are funded. And this is kind of what that R1 status is really about. It's about doing research projects that aren't directly tied to curriculum per se. I mean, they're related to uh, classes that they the those faculty members will be teaching, but it's really the more independent type of research. And you'll get to do that even at the, at the uh, undergraduate level, but especially as you start to get into the, end of the master's level programs where you're only taking nine or maybe 12 units a semester, you have more time to work and collaborate and participate in research. Um, and even if you're working in industry here, this is, I think, where the National Security Collaboration Center comes in. You get a chance. Your employer may connect you in to go spend some of your working hours on these projects working in this research capacity where you have academia and public uh, sector and private sector all working together. So the, so the education, again, I'll compare it to, to in my days when I was going through college. It was really all about the theory, the book learning, and those type pieces there. At UTSA right now, just like you talked about, we're, we're exposing our students, and it does. It includes our bachelor students that are understanding the practical and the complexities of challenges of whether it be putting out a product uh, or providing a service. Uh, so, so there is that learning where it's actually somewhat I'll call the hands-on learning. Often it's in terms of an internship, whether that be a federal government internship. Right now we have three of our UTSA graduates that are doing what are called uh, Palace Acquire back at U.S. Cyber Command headquarters uh, back at Fort Meade. We have numerous that finish up uh, that through the National Security Collaboration Center do an internship with several of our partners here. Uh, and, and those partners uh, expose them with their uh, to to these capabilities, to the products that they're developing, uh, to the projects that they're working, to the initiatives and the te emerging technologies they're working on, and that's absolutely tremendous. Additionally, many of these students are then hired by these same companies here in San Antonio, uh, giving them the opportunity to stay here rather than having to go to other areas for the cyber and cybersecurity job. Yeah, and I'm uh, while well, we're. Uh recording today's program i'm wearing a students and startups t-shirt if you want to listen uh, look uh, online and learn about that program uh i don't know if we've had any students and startups interns on the program yet maybe we we need to do a program on this with some of them but it's a, a university and san antonio um, startup collaboration so that if you want to work uh, in cybersecurity or other areas there, uh, UTSA students can uh, sign up in that. And, the, and we've, at my cybersecurity company, had um, more interns in that program than I think any other company um, over the last three years. So there's, yeah, opportunities uh, and lots of things going on in the ecosystem here to connect those students not only to research while they're in class, but over the summer um, into real-world real, real world opportunities. And I know um, some other folks that you've mentioned, IP Secure and others, also um, run real strong internships programs to give those students uh, access to um, real-world uh, work environments while they're still in school. 
Uh, so as we're um, uh, going to run out of time here, we could continue to talk all day. Um, but both of us have day jobs uh, that are not uh, just talking on the radio. So uh, you mentioned artificial intelligence a couple of times. So uh, I guess how does this tie into the National Security Collaboration Center, School of Data Science? Like, I mean, is the, the Terminator coming out next week or like yeah. a ex machina? Are we going to have the, the robot that tricks us all and, and ends the world? Or how are you guys uh, kind of putting this all together and, and working on it from a collaboration center and research perspective? Yeah, so so that's a great point. And, and, and I'll, I'll go back to you. you were just talking about the importance of UT Health. And, and we tend to separate in our brain, hey, that's a health problem. That's a uh, military problem. That's an air problem. Uh, uh, across the board, when in reality, when we start talking about artificial intelligence, that covers all the breadth of that. There's a huge need for data science and artificial intelligence. I guess the best example I'll give, because it's a little bit of machine learning and artificial intelligence, but when I got in my car to drive down here, uh, and, and I suddenly uh, my uh, my phone rings up and says, hey, it's time to go to uh, down to downtown for your radio interview. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, I didn't have to tell it anything, right? This this phone just looks out there, talking to my Outlook account, talking to my calendar, talking to all that. That is a big piece of what I'll call that machine learning. Things that, you know, you get in your car and all of a sudden it says, it's time to go home. It looks at the yeah. clock. It looks at all that information. And and that is a cross cutter across the board there, that intersection of, of artificial intelligence and how do we how do we be able to take that data that the machine all of a sudden does the work for you that we we take the human out of the loop and only put the human in it where we need it to be able to use that important information hey it's six o'clock uh brett usually goes home around now yeah uh and and here's where his home is and those type of things so so that piece of artificial intelligence really does cut across many everything we do in life it really cuts across that and we have right now in fact uh shortly uh uh and and we'll make sure this is on the website but on november 11th we're going to do that artificial uh, intelligence consortium bringing in some of the smartest people who've been working on the both the challenges of securing and and making sure the algorithms are what what folks need to be able to get the right information the right decision-making tools to be able to do that and be able to manage risk. And so that's a big piece of what artificial intelligence is all about. And and we have just hired about eight of the smartest folks from all over government industry. Uh, um, Dr. Darisha Kay, I'll call her, uh, and, and she's going to be hosting this organ, this thing up at UTSA here on November 11th. And we'll make sure we have that on your website for the readers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I'm going to, uh, if you'll give me permission, steal that analogy that you used about the, the your phone telling you it was time to, to hop in the car and drive down here. And I think this is a great way to describe kind of where we are for our listeners on artificial intelligence right now. Would you trust your car to drive itself down here right now? I'm not ready for that yet. I, no. I did have the opportunity to do the, the Tesla drive yeah. and, and see that we're, we're making a way a long way. Uh, but we're not there yet, right, yeah. uh, of being able to tie all of these uh, uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, and tie our car to those type pieces there. Uh, I, I will tell you, we're, but we're moving in the right direction. For all sure. All of these things are, are, are good in terms of what we're trying to develop. Unfortunately, there's always an adversary who wants to be able to trick you and to be able to do those things. And that's, that's one of the challenges we have now in terms of making it resilient, uh, and, and never a perfect system. But when I get out on the road, I'm not the perfect driver either, right? No. None of us are. And so how do we make it better than what the, the humans can do, but still allow the human in the loop to make that final decision when it's important? Because when it comes down to it between a machine and a human, I want the human to have a vote. Yeah, and I think this is the kind of the, the great piece. So you trust the AI right now to analyze your schedule and the traffic patterns out on the roads and, and estimate how long it's going to take to find parking and all those things downtown. You trust it to do that for you, and then it can present you that summarized information of like, hey, guy, if you would like to be at your next meeting, you should hop in the car right now because there's a wreck or whatever on the freeway. You trust it to tell you that information. And, and similarly, on the cybersecurity side of things, I think AI has made great leaps forward. And if you're not using artificial intelligence to help analyze all of the sensor information that you're getting and then summarize and, and surface events that require human investigation. Now, I, should you have AI doing the investigation and making cybersecurity decisions? 
Um, probably not. Um, not at this point, and especially like if it's a defensive decision where you're going to shut off and deny services to potentially your employees or your customers or whatever else. I think I would want a human at the end of the loop there where you, before you were going to shut off services that would impact um, many users and, and certainly on the the offensive side of things and this is one of those really messy areas legally as well right now it's like uh, in the cyber world are you allowed to um, go back upstream and stop things from attacking you not really if you're a private industry not really even maybe if you're a a, a state government agency um, it's it's a messy area but I certainly wouldn't want to turn an AI attacking system loose because who knows where and when and how that's going to control itself so Thank you uh, very much for joining us this week. If you uh, just tuned in uh, on the radio right now, this is Cyber Talk Radio. You can check out more on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com or on all of your favorite podcasting services out there across the Internet. And if uh, you don't see Cyber Talk Radio on the podcasting service you prefer, uh, let us know on Facebook or Twitter. We will fix that and we will get you a Cyber Talk Radio T-shirt.